introduce myself a tiny little bit. I am a general practitioner in Melbourne and I have spent about two to three years working with exotic animals, including birds, reptiles. I've also got about six years of practice as a general practitioner and emergency veterinarian. So to start with, I'm just going to have do a very, very brief discussion on bird anatomy. And I'm not going to go into a huge detail about it, but I just want to talk very briefly on the respiratory anatomy and the gastrointestinal system. So with birds, we'll start with the respiratory anatomy. So birds are a little bit different to mammals. With mammals, our lungs expand and decrease in size as we breathe. Birds have rigid lungs and they have nine separate air sacs which pass air through them and which can store air. So generally bird, birds can take in a lot more oxygen than humans um, or any other mammals and, they, and that's why they can breathe at much higher altitudes to um, mammals. The reason, the other thing that you do have to remember, and this is a little bit more important when we start talking about bird anesthesia, is that the, they essentially move, the air sacs move air in and out of their lungs. The lungs don't really move that much. So that is important. The other thing, reason I've mentioned the air sacs is that when you do bird x-rays, if you do ever do bird x-rays, you will get some shadowing caused by the air sacs. So that's a little bit about the respiratory system. In terms of the gastrointestinal system, again, there's a little bit of difference between mammals and birds. So to start off with, most birds have what's called a crop. So a, the crop is a fairly flaccid sac that stores a lot of material. So when they eat, it goes into the crop and then slowly descends from the crop into the proventriculus and ventriculus. The crop is quite soft. They, a lot of the time, if the crop can also get infections because there's a certain amount of food that's stored in there. And it, but surgery wise, it's probably the easier one to get to. Once things get into the proventriculus and gizzard, you sh should remember. Um, certain birds like chickens will have a certain level of gravel or small stones in their gizzard to help with grinding down food. That's quite normal if you ever see that. But also the gizzard can is much harder to access in terms of surgical approach. Um, and then there's small intestine and cloaca. So with birds, they rather than having three separate openings, they have one opening for the urinary system, the gastrointestinal system, and the reproductive system, and everything comes out through that cloaca. So that's kind of all I want to say about the anatomy. Um, so when it comes to pet birds, and I will be stressing this throughout this presentation, husbandry and care of them is one of the most important things. Good diets, good care, good cages and cage equipment and a decent amount of <clears throat> enrichment will generally solve a lot of issues that you're going to see in pet birds. So, and also when you are taking the clinical history, asking about diet, asking about the environment, asking how owners are caring for their birds is going to act also give you a lot of answers. So to start off with, Appropriate diets, ideally, we would like birds on pellets. Um, if that's not available, a certain amount of seed is all right. But we do want our birds to be getting daily access to vegetables and fruit. So they should be getting absolute fruit and veggies every day. And that should be changed over as well daily. For ducks and chickens, they, ideally, they should also have access to small insects for protein. And have, if they're in a yard and they're allowed to roam around, generally that sorts itself out. The other thing I'll be talking about is cage equipment and size and the and types of toys that you can get in because metal toys and rope toys can be quite dangerous to birds. 
And finally, enrichment. So enrichment is essentially keeping these animals entertained, keeping these animals from getting bored. Because like dogs and cats um, and most other animals, if they get bored, they start getting behavioral problems, they start getting destructive and they start causing more issues. Keep in mind, most parrots are, have the capacity of about a two-year-old or a three-year-old. So these are intelligent animals. We need to be giving them stuff to stimulate their brain. So let's start off with diet. So on the side, as I say, ideally we should have about 30% of greens, 30% of pellets, 15% fruit and fruit and 10% seeds and 5% trees. When it comes to greens and vegetables, we want them on dark leafy greens. So spinach, broccoli, bok choy, any dark green endives, silver beet, beetroot leaves, and also yellow and red vegetables. So capsicum, carrot, tomato, corn, chili, um, all those sorts of vegetables are great. B birds love chilies. They can't taste the spice. So they think it just tastes sweet and they have, they really, really enjoy it. In terms of fruits, apples, oranges, grapes, pear, mango, bananas, any of those are fine. Um, and a lot of the fruits that you'll find, you know, at the local market are also good, but that should be a large portion of their diet. What you can get people to do is just, sometimes you can just pop the, fruit and leaves in the cage and they'll pick off the leaves. And as I, and I tell a lot of people with chilies, just cut a chili in half and pop it in the cage and that'll provide them with entertainment and food. But a lot of people sometimes, some people prefer to make up a mix of food and freeze it and then give small bits at a time. So that's kind of veggies and fruit. You can also add in beans and legumes. So chickpeas, dal, moon beans, are all great to add in and they're fine to feed raw or cooked. I would stay away from other beans fed raw. So ideally, you just want, you want to at least boil the beans there. You can also give sprouts and grass. So sometimes, especially for chickens and ducks, they will peck at grass they find outside and you can pick grass from the garden and give them, but just make sure they are free from any spray or anything like that. And there are some examples of grass on there. And finally, we get to sort of pellets and seeds and treats. So with pellets, um, ideally you want a good brand of pellet. There are a lot of different brands out there. Um, the colorful pellets are not necessarily good pellets, just as a warning of that. But there's the brands I've listed up on the screen are generally the best quality ones going around. If you can't get pellets, and, that, and I'm not sure whether you can or can't in India, but if you can't, seed is fine, but ideally not more than 40% of the diet. And really, you need to stay away from the really fatty seeds, so no sunflower or safflower seeds. Sunflower seeds are incredibly fatty. It's like going and eating the oiliest paratha you can find, and then giving the bird that and only that for most of its life. So try and keep sunflower seeds as a treat at the most. If you, the other thing I was gonna say is try and stay away from some of the seed mixes um, and try and make sure that the seeds you're giving are appropriate for the type of bird you've got. So don't give chicken feed or seeds to budgerigars or cockatiels. In terms of treats, there are a whole bunch of different treats you can give. Almonds are quite good. Um, Kotang nuts, if you've got them, small and small pieces of a little bit of chicken or bread or brown rice are also fine. So that's diet, but again, treats are small amounts. You can use them, owners can use them for training and they can use them to interact with their birds and try and encourage the birds to build a better relationship with the owner, but that it should only be a little bit of the diet. These are foods that you should absolutely avoid. So do not give them avocado. It does cause liver disease. Um, onion and garlic can also cause blood issues. Rhubarb 
is just bad for their gut. Um, and then chocolate, caffeine, really salty foods, really high fat foods should also be avoided. Okay, so that's diet kind of covered for most birds. The next thing to talk about is cage size and positioning. So ideally your cage size, if you depending on the bird that you've got, should be large enough for them to stretch their wings out without touching the sides of the cage. And they should be able to sit on a perch in the cage without their tail touching the floor and without their head touching the top of the cage. Um, if the bird is going to be one of those where the owner takes it out of the cage a lot and it's allowed to roam around the house, that's fine. The cages don't actually need to be quite as big as that. But if the bird is going to spend, be spending its entire life in the cage, then the cages do need to be a large enough to allow them to groom and play and move around happily. Birds tend to fly horizontally. So a longer cage is better than like a thin, tall, high cage. The other thing is in terms of placement, ideally we should be in, it should be in a room that's well lit so they can get some sunlight um, and also placed on a stand that's at kind of head or chest height for the human. Birds don't really like being on the floor that off that much. And especially if the owner has other animals such as cats or dogs, being on at floor level is going to stress the bird out a lot. In terms of enrichment, so enrichment is basically giving them exercises to keep their brain active and to keep them from getting bored and starting destructive behaviors or in some cases like self destructive um, habits. So as one thing you can do for enrichment is mixing up diet. As I said, with the chilies, cut a chili in half, chuck it in the cage. They love playing with seeds, with the seeds of the chili. Birds are messy, but they will happily fling that chili all over the place. And also providing them with a variety of food is good as well. If you think about birds in the wild, they're not eating the same thing every day. They are moving around and eating a mixture of different foods, so that helps. When it comes to toys, you ideally want them to be untreated wood or paper. So you can make foraging boxes out of cardboard, newspaper. What you do is you basically strip a bit of newspaper into pieces, put it in a little in a small box, and put some treats there or put some food in there for them and put it in the cage and let them hunt through the paper to try and find the treats. And, and there's an example here with egg cartons. So you can see you can put the treats and or, bit, or you can put stuff on the cardboard and the birds have to get to it and try and get the food out of there and try and open the cartons to get stuff. Don't use metal or rope toys. Birds tend to eat them and that causes more issues down the track. The other thing with enrichment is also interaction with people. Birds, a lot of birds are quite social animals. There aren't that many bird species that are solitary. So if you have a bird in a cage by itself, it is going to get a little bit lonely. And, with, and if the owners are willing, they can have the bird with them, they can spend time, spend time, spending time with the bird is great and bonding that way and also in, and interacting with them. And we will cover a little bit on appropriate interaction and touching of birds a little bit further later in this presentation. So this is husbandry. So these are also questions you should be asking when you are doing a bird consult. So what sort of cage is it kept in? What are you feeding your bird? What toys do you have for your bird? Does the bird have any companions? And where is the cage kept? And how often does the, how long does the bird spend in there? So that is kind of your basis. And from there, you can make a lot of diagnoses. So now we're going to start talking about clinical techniques. So with blood collection, main thing to um, remember is that birds are very small. So you can really only take 10% of a bird's body weight. So for example, a budgie is usually about 30 grams. Do not take more than 0.3 mil. And if a rain blows, just stop. 
and get them to come back unless you absolutely need to take a little bit of blood, stop, get the owner to come back the next, in a couple of days time, once that leakage of blood has settled. Best way areas to take blood from are jugular, wing and leg. So here is a demonstration of someone holding up a bird's neck and the jugular runs vertically down the neck of the bird, just slightly lateral to the midline. What you would normally do is get someone to hold the bird and then you hold your index and middle finger and you raise the rein with your thumb as this um, person's showing you here. And then I'd normally use a very, very small needle. So the smallest needle you've got. If you have insulin needles, they are fantastic for using for blood collection, but the smallest needle you've got and do not use anything bigger than a one mil syringe because you will put too much pressure on the vein and collapse it. With the leg vein, it's a little bit easier to see, um, especially if you swab it with some metal. And sometimes if it is a bit of a cold day, putting a little bit of a heat pack on there for about five to 10 seconds will actually cause the vein to come up a little bit more. These are great on chickens uh, and ducks. You can access them really well and you can get them a lot of blood out of them. If you are using them on smaller parrots, I'd say really only use them for pack cell volume or hematocrit measurements. You're not going to get a huge amount of blood out of them otherwise. When it comes to the wing vein, that's best taken, bloods from that are best taken under anesthetic. As a general rule, if your bird is not used to being handled that often, um, sometimes it is easier to take bloods under a very, very short gaseous anesthetic, and it is less stressful to both the bird and the people involved. So that's blood collection. The other thing um, that you should be looking at every time you get a bird is the type of feces. So bird feces and urine comes out together and it has three components. So you will have, my apologies for the picture, it was the best one I could find. So you will have on the piece of paper, if a bird defecates, um, you will have a red spot, which is urine. And that should be clear, and that should be about 50% of the total. You will have urates. So birds and lizards produce urates from their urinary system, which is of, of similar to sort of uric acid, and that should be nice and white. And then you have a pellet of feces, which should be firm. So the urates and the feces should both be firm. And the feces should be a kind of greeny brown color. Depending on if the bird is on pellets, that can sometimes be a really light green color. But if it is dark green, or if they are having diarrhea, then, or if there's any sign of blood, the urates are a green color, that's when we need to start worrying. So if you ever get a bird, always, always, always check the feces. And then finally, with, if you are giving medication, in birds, most medication that you give in hospital is going to be IM. Your best location is the breast muscle or the pectoralis muscle. So that's demonstrated here. So you've got the sternum. So birds have a very big sternum with quite a lot of muscle because they are flighted animals. Um, and you can wet down feathers and move them aside to see the muscle and inject through there. Try and stay as close to the midline as possible uh, because that way, and use again a small needle because that way you will avoid going through the muscle into the chest or abdominal cavity. And with subcutaneous fluids, if you are given fluids, ideally you want to go into a leg fold. So if you spread, so if someone's holding the bed and you spread the legs, there is a fold of skin in this a sort of triangular fold of skin in this general area. And you can lift that up and give the fluids in there. Again, small needle and always make sure your fluids are warmed before you give them. That, and then bird anesthesia. I did see on the, 
that people did want to know about bird and data. So this is a very kind of brief um, summary of important points to know. Birds I do have a much quicker metabolism. So generally for anesthesia, we only fast them for about three hours before. You do not need to fast them for the whole morning. You will cause more problems on your bird. They breathe through their lungs and air sacs. So in an ideal world, you would keep your birds in lateral or ventral recumbency. If your birds are in dorsal recumbency, if for some reason you need to put them, oh, sorry. If for some reason you need to put them on their back, a lot of the time you do have to manually ventilate them. So a lot of places that do do regular bird surgeries will have a little ventilator for the birds to give them oxygen. The other thing is that birds, again, have an incredibly fast metabolism, so they get cold very, very quickly. Birds start losing heat within 20 minutes of being under anesthetic. So you need to have your birds on heat packs. You need to make sure that they are staying warm. Um, they are also quite delicate creatures. So ideally try and keep your anesthetics to be less than 40 minutes. Anything over 40 minutes and the um, death rate tends to be a lot higher. And also with anesthetics, try and plan your procedure and do as much as possible. So if you have a bird that needs, you know, bloods and x-rays and things, knock it out, do your x-rays, do your bloods, do as much as you can and make sure that you have everything there and ready to go before you even knock the bird out. So, and there's a, in terms of anesthetic drugs, ideally, most, look, a lot of the time I would be using inhaled anesthesia. So pop the bird in a little mask and use isoflurane or sevoflurane. If you've got halothane, try and avoid it. If, causes horrendous recoveries in birds and it's much, much less safe. The good thing with gaseous anesthetic as well is that you can switch them on to, once you switch them back onto oxygen, they wake up from anesthesia very, very quickly as well. In terms of injectable anesthetics, there are a few different ones that you can use. Um, normally I'd give them as an IM pre-med before I use the gas to put them under anesthetic, um, but some of them you can use via the induction. So normally I'd give you either straight butop, just butopnol, um, or I'd use midazolam butopnol combination. You can also use midazolam ketamine combination for slightly more active birds. Um, the other thing to remember with birds is they have slightly different opioid receptors to mammals. So butopinol is your best opioid pain relief for them. So especially if you've got a slightly painful procedure, um, I'd be using a butopinol as my pre-med. Now I've got a little example of an anesthetic protocol for birds for here. So first thing is to give them a pre-med. As I said, I normally just use butopinol IM or midazolam butopinol. Midazolam has some advantages in that it does cause a little bit of memory loss, so they aren't quite as surprised or stressed when they wake up from anesthetic. It can on, also be given intranasal if you really need to. However, it does, I have noticed that birds do take longer to wake up after it, so just keep that in mind as well. With any small animal that you're doing, so whether it's rabbits, guinea pigs, or birds, pre-oxygenate them for at least five minutes. You can do this if you've got someone there to hold the bird and hold a mask over its head, you can do that by mask. Otherwise, if you do have a little oxygen tent or you can make one um, using just any sort of plastic box that you can put your anesthetic tubing into, you can do it that way. Um, then I'd induce with gaseous isofluorine by mask, which normally takes only like a couple of minutes, and maintain the birds on mask um, inhalation, on mask via gaseous inhalation, or via a very, very small non cuffed ET tube. Do not, if you are using an ET endotracheal tube that has a cuff on it, do not cuff it up. You can quite significantly damage the trachea. I also set a timer 
for any bird procedure that I'm doing. So I will set a timer for 30 minutes maximum. And after this time, wake the bird up. And I also recover them in a heated O2 tent or oxygen box. So they have oxygen going on or they're recovering in a uh, area with oxygen as well. And again, the heat, because as I said before, they get cold very, very easily. This is all being recorded by Dr. Dixon. So if anyone's taking notes, don't worry, it'll all be there for you. Okay, the, so you get a bird that comes to you and the owner is saying, look, my bird's just looking a bit unwell. This parrot that you can see here is a perfect example of what we call the sick bird look. So you can see from its body, it is all fluffed up and it's not standing up really nice and straight. It is kind of slightly hunched and it's puffing its feathers up to try and increase warmth. Its eyes are a little bit closed. Um, it just looks, and it looks very lethargic. This is a bird that is really quite sick. This is a bird that needs treatment pretty much now. And, um, and really when, it, when they look like this, I would not be, I would be getting them into hospital now. I would not wait 24 hours. If they're fluffed up, if they're just a little bit fluffed up, but they're still eating, you can wait a couple, about 24 hours, but that is the absolute maximum. And just remember this kind of image for sick birds. Okay, so let's start talking about some common bird diseases that you can see. The first one that I'm going to talk about is quite common, or we see quite a lot here, and it is zoonotic. So it causes disease in humans as well. So chlamydia or chlamydiosis is caused by a bacteria, Chlamydophila cityci. It affects, there are multiple different variants that affect multiple bird species. So it affects everything from chickens to turkeys to budgies. Uh, uh, it really, I don't, I can't think of a bird species that doesn't infect. It's most commonly seen in parrots and it causes psittacosis in humans. So if you have a bird that has this and their owner seems to be having respiratory issues, any sort of signs of respiratory disease, tell them to go, if you can get them to their local doctor to get tested for psittacosis. Clinical signs of chlamydiosis in birds are sneezing, lots of discharge from eyes and nose, green urate, so you'll see here, <laughs> you'll see here um, from the feces, there's a little bit of diarrhea and the urates, instead of being the nice white color that they were in the previous slide, are a greenish color, this really bright green color. Birds also lose weight and they're also lethargic. And in some cases it can come on really suddenly. So a bird might have seemed fine, you know, two days ago and suddenly it looks rather, or it might've had just a couple of sneezes about two to three days ago. And then suddenly it looks really, really flat and unwell. But these are all kind of clinical signs for this. In terms of what it is, it is an infection that's activated by stress and it's most commonly seen in younger birds. Young birds, a lot of birds are carriers of this disease. So they, the bacteria can live quite happily kind of in their respiratory tract and not really cause too much issue. But if they become stressed, their immunity is lowered and that causes the um, organism to reproduce and cause, start causing infection. In terms of diagnosis, it is partially based on clinical signs. There is also an immunocomb and PCR test. So you can, in some cases, send it off, the off to the lab for testing. Um, and the immunocomb is a test that you can do in-house and you can buy the kits from a few different suppliers. Keep in mind though, if you have budgerigars, the immunocomb test does not show chlamydia disease or does not work for them. If you are treating a bird with chlamydia, you want to use do supportive care. So start off 
any bird that comes in sick, you want to give it foods, you want to warm it up. In these birds, you can give them meloxicam as well. And the main, most common treatment for it is doxycycline. So if you get the injectable doxycycline, it is 100 mix per gig per bird. Uh, for a bird in, with, by intramuscular injection, and we do that weekly for six weeks. If you can't get the injectable form, but you do have the um, paste form for that we use for cats and dogs, you can also use that for birds as well, and then that you give twice a day. But again, the treatment has to be for six weeks. If you are doing intramuscular injection, cycling, try and alternate. Um, you'll be doing it into the breast muscle. Try and alternate the side that you give it each time the animals, the bird comes in for its injection. Because if you do one side too much, you can you do risk run the risk of necrosis. So that's that. And again, if you are handling birds like this, be very careful about your hygiene as well. So washing your hands really, really carefully. If you are really worried, wear a mask when dealing with them um, and just getting yourself tested if you do notice that you are having any respiratory disease signs as well. So that's probably one of the more common diseases that you'll see in birds. Now let's go on to to uh, toxicities. So if you remember when I was talking about husbandry, you did, I was saying do not use metal or rope toys. The reason for metal, you don't use metal toys is that birds like to chew on everything. If we go back to the image of them being a toddler, they like to put everything in their mouth. And a lot of metal toys are coated in zinc. Um, quite a few other, there are a few old cages and stuff that have lead soldering on the bars um, or lead under the plastic, on the plastic paint coating. And both of those can cause toxicities. And what birds do is they eat tiny little bits of the metal and it and their body can't break it down, and so it accumulates in their stomach or their ventriculus and proventriculus. And then once it builds up to a certain level in there, it starts causing clinical signs, and they start having heavy metal toxicity. So, what are the signs um, of this? Uh, similar to chlamydia, is having bright, bright, bright green feces. Um, which is a general indicator of liver disease, but it's very, very common in heavy metal poisoning. A lot of birds are very weak, so they have neurological signs, so they're weak. They're taxic. Some birds seem to be paralyzed on one side of the body. A lot of your birds with this are going to be presenting to you with seizures. So the bird suddenly starts seizuring and the owner brings it down to the clinic in a panic. A slight before that, you will also notice some vomiting in some birds as well. How do you diagnose it? A few different things, clinical signs. So a lot of birds that come to you with present with seizures uh, are going to be heavy metal toxicity. The other thing would be metal fragments in the stomach on x-ray. Oh, sorry. So here is an x-ray of a bird. Um, on its back, and you can see here the lovely air sacs there. And this right here is a whole bunch of metal fragments in the gastrointestinal tract. So when you see this on x-ray, that's pretty much pathognomonic for heavy metal toxicity. In terms of treatment, it varies slightly on the type of metal. Um, I would normally, if they're coming in to me, seizure, you know, they're coming to me really, really ill. I would start them on injectable calcium EDTA and that will cover zinc and lead and your dose rates are there. And the other thing that you want to do is again, fluid therapy because often they're coming into you in a very, very weakened state. And some animals will also need crop feeding as well. Once they're a little bit more stable, or if these are animals that have not quite got to the seizuring level yet, you can use oral DMSA or D-penicillamine um, as treatment as well. 
And the other thing is that you have to remember is that the metal fragments also cause significant liver damage. So you want them on supportive therapy for their liver. With the metal chelation um, treatment, so DMSA, calcium EDTA, penicillamine, most birds will have to be on this long term, so sometimes a year or more, until the metal is slowly, slowly dissolves in their system. In terms of the liver disease, you would be wanting to use milk thistle is a really common one, and you can get that at a lot of um, naturopaths or herbalist places, and colchinine as well. If you can get that compounded, sometimes large animal vets will also have it. Milk thistle is probably the most common one and the easiest to find. So the plant looks like that. If um, we, you do have those plants there, uh, or if you're looking for a packet of the dried herb, this will often be the picture that you see on the front of the packet. Again, the drug dose is up there for you. Okay, the other thing, so that's heavy metal toxicity. Um, I also said to worry, avoid rope toys. And the reason for this is birds like to eat them as well. So chickens will eat absolutely anything. I have removed large stones. I have removed a plastic car from a chicken's crop at one point, just because they really, really will eat absolutely anything. Most of the time though, <coughs> pardon me, with parrots, it is rope toys. So rope toys fray at the edges, parrots will pick at them and pick at them, and then they will ingest small amounts and it builds up in the abdomen and gut. Well, in their gastrointestinal tract. Occasionally, they will also ingest small pieces of plastic as well. The birds that have been eating these will often be really lethargic. They'll be straining to defecate. They will sometimes have bloody diarrhea. Um, sometimes they'll be vomiting, depending on where it's blocked up. And often they're lethargic and inappetent as well. But straining to defecate is a really good sign, and the bloody diarrhea is a really good sign as well. In terms of diagnosis, if you sometimes you will be able to see small fragments of rope in droppings, or they will have like fragments of rope sticking out of their cloaca. Sometimes, in some cases, you'll actually be able to feel it, depending on where it is. Um, and other times, if it is like rope in the proventriculus, a barium study is also a good idea. So this is an example of a barium study. So you can see the barium starts in the crop and then slowly filters through. And we've got a little bit, the crop's not filling quite fully, so there is a foreign body in there. Yeah. In terms of treatment, if it is a small object and the bird is a large bird and it's sitting in the ventriculus of the stomach, you can sometimes retrieve that endoscopically. If it's in the crop, you can go in surgically and remove it. However, if it is a very small bird and it is a fairly large rope blockage, um, there is, surgery is not going to be successful to remove it. And a lot of the time we tend to recommend euthanasia in these cases, unfortunately. <laughs> so now we're going, I'm going to move on to a couple of reproductive diseases. The first one that you might see, especially if owners are trying to breed their birds, is egg binding. So egg binding is what we call what is what we call what happens when the egg blocks in the oviduct. So the egg is sitting in the duct, but they are unable to actually lay the egg. <clears throat> Sometimes this is because the egg is too big and it's quite a small bird. Sometimes it's due to most of the time it's more likely due to a muscular nutritional issue. So some causes can include birds that are chronic egg layers. So in some chickens, the, because they're laying eggs so regularly and so often, the muscles in the oviduct become a little bit weakened and can't really push the egg out. And sometimes it's a calcium deficiency. And you'll see this in some birds with the quality of their eggshells as well. But a lot of 
see. It's often common in parrots where they've got um, malnutrition. They just don't have enough calcium to be able to really push that egg out. Some uh, birds that are obese as well will have issues because they don't have as much mus muscle. Um, and birds that are sort of sitting in the cage the whole day and not really doing anything to move them. So move their muscles and they'll be weak. So think of it as similar things that would cause, you know, humans to have difficulty giving birth. And sometimes you can have also tumors and mutations in the reproductive tract as well, and that can cause issues. In terms, so this is a beautiful radiograph of it. So you can see the egg is here and it is quite firmly stuck there. So your clinical signs of these birds are lethargy and depressions. So they're usually very, very, they're fluffed up, they're quiet, they are straining a lot. They have a very wide base stance. So if, if they were um, a person, they'd be standing with their legs wide apart because they're trying to push this egg out. Sometimes they've got a bit of a swollen abdomen and a lot of the time they do have an increased respiratory rate as well. A lot partially that sometimes because the egg is pushing um, other organs up and that's impacting on the acid but a lot of the time that really wide based stance, so they've, they've kind of spread their legs as wide as they can to try and push this egg out, is, and their straining is a really good indication of that. In terms of diagnosis, a lot of the time it is x-rays, but sometimes um, in a lot of the smaller birds, you can actually palpate the egg as well. And there are a few different methods of treatment, and it really, really depends on how what the cause of the issue is or, and how sick the bird is. So again, if the bird is quite unwell, oxygen therapy, fluid therapy, try and warming it up. And also, and especially if you think it is a weakness issue, calcium gluconate intramuscularly. Dilute, the dosage really depends on how weak the bird is, but make sure you dilute it. Usually it's a one to one, so like a 50% ratio with saline. If the bird is relatively bright and straining a little bit and it just seems to be a little bit of muscle issues, you can apply prostaglandin gel to the sphincter. Now prostaglandin gel you can get from a lot of chemists um, um, or drug, drug stores depending on what you call them and that's the dose for the bird is there and you actually apply that in the cloaca so put it on a cotton tip and apply it there. One thing to say is that if you do have any pregnant staff or staff who are looking to be pregnant, um, avoid them touching it. Generally, whether you're male or female, wear gloves if you're going to touch prostaglandin gel because it absorbs through our skin as well and can cause issues there. Um, in some rare cases, if the bird is really, really struggling, you can do what we call transabdominal oversynthesis, which is where you stick a needle into the abdomen and collapse the egg. And there is a beautiful example of that there. It is, so what one person is doing is holding the bird, the other person is pushing the egg up. So it is right at the edge of the body wall. And then you stick a needle into it and you draw out all the yolk and try and collapse the egg as much as possible. And then sometimes you can kind of go in and pull it out. This, Generally, it should be done under anesthetic, and it is very a, a very tricky procedure. It is also what I would normally say is the worst case scenario. So if nothing else has worked, then and you don't think that anything else is going to help, then go in and do this. But be very, very careful. Be very careful doing it and warn the owners that there is a significant amount of risk doing it. Also, make sure that you have the egg right against the body wall, because if you stick a needle, in, in to any other organ, you can cause a lot of trouble. Okay. And then the other reproductive issue that you will see a lot is egg yolk peritonitis. So this is most commonly seen in chickens and chickens that, and chicken breeds that are for laying. And I will have to watch my time. <laughs> so, Isa brown chickens, so any chickens that are used, used to be battery hens, um, all were designed for egg laying only. 
most of the time, what these chickens are bred for is to lay as many eggs as they possibly can in their lifetime. And then usually at about two years old, they are or over one and a half years old, they are then sent to the abattoir. So they then develop reproductive issues over one and a half years old because they're not meant to, they were never bred for a long lifespan. They were bred just to lay eggs. What happens? So this is your reproductive tract of your hen. So you've got your ovaries here. Follicles develop on the ovaries. So your follicle is what becomes your egg yolk. It then has to get from the ovary, it has to basically get into the oviduct here and then travel through the whole of the oviduct where the yolk and, al well, sorry, where the albumin is added and the eggshell is added and then forms and then the shell is completely formed here and then comes out through the cloaca. What happens, however, there is a gap between the infundibulum and the ovary. So in some cases, the ovum or the follicle completely misses the ovary duct and goes into the abdominal or cilomic cavity. When that happens, um, you will get birds, um, mostly chickens, as I said, who are incredibly lethargic. Chickens in particular will have a very pale comb or wattle. They'll have a big swollen abdomen, wide base stance, and they will be inappetent. In terms of diagnosing it, a lot of the time it is based on breed and age and also clinical signs, but also you will sometimes see fluid opacity in the sebum. And you will also be able to pull egg yolk out of the ab abdomen or sebum. So this is what a chicken who has, um, <coughs> pardon me, has egg yolk peritonitis. So this is the postmortem of a chicken who has egg yolk peritonitis. So you can see the yolk and fluid there and you can see really the actual yolk formed. It's also enough to put your chicken for life sometimes. In terms of treatment, again, supportive therapy, but drain the fluid from there. So sticking a needle in and drain the fluid. Again, be very, very careful. Try, you need to replace the fluid that you drain. So you need to give them fluid therapy. And then I start them on antibiotics and meloxicam. So, and the doses are there. If you, if it is a chicken, you can actually tablet chickens really, really easily. You open their beak and you shove a tablet down their throat. It is incredibly easy. And you can teach your owners to do it very well as well. The other thing that you want to do is we want to stop them reproducing because pretty much if they've had egg yolk peritonitis once, they're going to have it again and they are going to have other reproductive issues. So what I normally do is a does laurelin implant. Um, you will, you can potentially know it as supralaurelin is the um, drug name for it. Oops, sorry, um, is the brand name for it, and it's used in dogs a lot to control reproduction. But you can use it in any bird, and we put it in, into the breast muscle via intramuscular injection and it lasts about six to 12 months. Keep in mind, if you do have owners that actually want to treat their birds for this, warn them that egg yolk peritonitis is a recurring issue. <coughs> Most of the time, you will be able to spot it better the second time over or the owners get a lot better at spotting it the second time over. And, but it is something that you will be treating multiple times. And especially when the implant starts wearing off, you will be seeing signs of it coming up again. So that's that. And then finally, the, uh, another really common thing that you'll be seeing is feather plucking and loss. Um, there are sort of three main causes for this. The more simple one will, would be mites. Um, and you treat that with ivermectin dropped on but some birds can get, but basically mites make birds really itchy, so they will pluck their feathers. The other thing that can make them pluck their feathers is pain. So it's a bit like a dog or a cat licking constantly at a sore area. Birds can't really lick it, so they just keep plucking at it. So sometimes if you get a bird who's 
further plucking at one particular spot, um, just be aware that there's a good chance that there's some pain there. And then the third infectious cause, common infectious cause is what's called cytosine beacon further disease. Now this is common in Australia and it's very widespread in the wild birds. I don't know how common it is in India. I couldn't really find too many reports about it. But basically it is a viral disease that causes feathers to fall out and the skin to become very, very flaky and dry. There is unfortunately no cure for it. So we just support the birds. It is eventually fatal. Um, so that's your kind of main infection um, disease issues. The other cause for feather plucking is boredom or dietary issues. So as I said before, these birds, these animals are intelligent. If they get bored, it, they're going to start self-destructive behaviors. And it's a bit like, you know, someone who's really bored biting their nails or chewing their hair or pulling at their hair. If it is a boredom issue, so if you don't look at the feathers and they look really nice and shiny, the coat's good, there isn't a lot of dry, flaky skin, then it could be boredom. So check what sort of enrichment they're getting. Start giving them enrichment if they're not getting any. any and check the environment and see if there's anything there that's sort of stressing them out or upsetting them. And also check the diet. If they are on a pure seed diet only, you will, they will be having some fatty liver issues and they will be as well have sort of boredom issues and they'll have some nutritional deficiencies and that can cause feather plucking and loss as well. And then the final reason that they can feather pluck is hormonal. So nesting birds will feather pluck to lie in a nest box. Birds that are handled by owners inappropriately will experience sexual frustration and will often feather pluck due to this. So this lovely chart is a very, very good example of where you should be, where an owner should be touching the parrot. So with wild parrots, flock members are around allowed to groom the head and the neck area. But only mates are allowed to groom the rest of the body. So owners who are giving their birds scratches on their head, absolutely fine. Owners who are giving their birds lots of kisses, who are kind of sitting the birds on like their chest and patting, stroking them a lot, and stroking their belly, stroking their back, being really, really cutesy with them, are uh, basically sending their bird a signal that they want sexual intercourse or that they want to mate with their bird. Birds aren't great at telling um, that, you know, humans are a different species and, and are unable to do this. So that leads to a whole bunch of sexual frustration and they self-harm and pluck feathers out because of that. So this is something to really check is if you've got a bird that's really well handled, how is it being handled? Um, if that is the case, and if we're having issues there, then the Deslaurelin implant will do a world of wonders. And you will also have to have a very awkward conversation with the owner and explain to them that they need to stop sexually harassing their bird. So that's that. So that's, I'm pretty much coming to the end of the talk. Um, if you want more information or you want a much more in-depth discussion of a lot of illnesses and surgery and medicine and surgery techniques, these two textbooks are fantastic. And this website also has a free clinical avian medicine textbook and with by chapters, you can download the PDFs and it also does has some wonderful information about bird hematology and biochemistry. So if you're ever looking at buds and it is brilliant, I still use it quite often. So that is the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I made sense. 
And do we have any questions? Um, right, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, the first is with the uh, leg vein, is that mm. lateral or medial? Medial. No, sorry, let me, I've got to remember it in my head. No, it's lateral. You can get it laterally. Um, and when you talk about the temperature of the bird droppings, do you take the rectal cloacal temperature and what yeah. should it be? Or what should um, it be? Ideally, it should be about 38. 37, 38, it should not drop below about 36.5 maximum. I am Dr. Paul from Chennai. Hello. I, I am Dr. Paul from Chennai. How will you treat mites in lovebirds, madam? In you... uh, ivermectin. So the injectable ivermectin, you can just drop it. So you part the feathers and you drop it on the back of the bird. Give me one minute and I can very quickly check the dose up for you. So generally, it is two to three mg per kg of ivermectin, and you apply that topically. A bit like the treatment for a dog or a cat, just drop it on the back of the neck. Thank you, madam. Thank you. I used to give uh, you know, uh, coriander leaves and pudina leaves uh, to the lovebirds. Yeah. It oh, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. It increases immunity level, it seems. Mm -hmm. it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, look, any leaves that you can give um, that in that that are safe are fantastic. So, and especially green leaves. So green, yellow, red veggies and leaves are great. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Can you please uh, say a few words about the vaccination schedule in the pet birds? Because prevention is better than cure. Yeah, look, we don't, generally in Australia for pet birds, you'll have vaccinations in farm chickens for a few different, so for like Murex disease. For In Australia, we don't really have any vaccinations that we give pet birds. Okay. Oh, okay. And there's a question from Dr. Iris Paul. <laughs> are, are you able to read that? Yes, um, I'm not entirely sure, Dr. Paul, I'm not entirely sure what the question is. That's terrible. Um, but I would, in terms of trying to avoid, you can't really avoid attracting the snakes apart from maybe cleaning out the cages regularly. But potentially if you can have the birds hung or hang the birds cage in a place where the cobras can't get to. Although it's cobras, so they get everywhere. Yes, so I'm not entirely sure how you would stop that. Uh, uh, Dr. I Iris Paul, please unmute. You are muted. We are not able to hear you. Actually, they say snakes have <laughs> rope and all that because they come and are hung outside in my tribal area in a basket and tied and the people leave for work. And um, in my home, I and my husband, when he was alive, to breed the dows and we matched colors, you know, we matched two by two mm -hmm. and created very many different varieties. Oh. Of we had more than 50, 60 of them and they were all uh, very clean and we cleaned the place every day. But then the cobras and the vipers started to come in and uh, they climbed the wall and they came into where these birds were. And so we had to, after his death, I just did not continue it after a couple of months because yeah. it was very frightening. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Too many cobras. And people said in my tribal area, oh, it's the smell of the dirt of the birds. So is it rude or is it just my imagination? Uh, I don't, I think it might be the smell of the birds itself or the presence of the birds there. I don't think it's necessary. I um, 
snakes don't really smell so it's more they they don't they don't really smell that much it's more sort of tasting the air but i don't think it would necessarily be bird dirt that's attracting them but it might just be the presence of the birds okay okay uh manage birds having oh you're welcome manage okay uh, dr vera selvam how to manage birds having severe respiratory distress um try and handle them as little as possible and if you have like a plastic box that you can put an anesthetic tube in into give them oxygen straight away hello doctor hello Uh, could you please uh, briefly explain the fracture of bones and repair fracture of bones yes uh, bone fractures the most common ones you're going to see are traumatic fractures uh, though there's sort of two types of fractures one can be um due to some fractures can be due to diet so if the birds are not on a great diet they're not having quite as much calcium as they should you will have yes. fractures because they'll have very brittle bones the other thing you're going to see is traumatic fractures from just injuring themselves in terms of fractures the good thing with bird bones is because they're mostly hollow if they're flighted birds their their bones are mostly hollow so they heal very quickly but you do need to splint them very very well um what i would say in terms of splinting is it try and use a really lightweight material so if you've got like balsa wood um or even you can make stuff out of like toothpicks and things like that as splints but just make sure they're very light so you don't cause muscle damage and most of the time you really only need them in for a couple of weeks but you do need to be changing the splints and checking the skin regularly for any damage there thank you thank you very diseases like uh, marax and the alc are common in the pet birds and also this uh, coccidiosis mm -hmm. coccidiosis then marax disease yeah marax and marax is more common in chickens we don't really see it in the in the parrots a uh, vaccination there i would have to look up the vaccination but most of the time vaccination for marix is done when they're chicks so i think it's like 2 weeks old and 6 weeks old and it's an oral vaccination okay. in terms of if you can the big so you um keep your rice clean and clean and change it going to avoid those